My name is Dozio Kafo, and I'm an under 40 CEO. The African Renaissance. The concept that the African people and nations shall overcome the current challenges confronting the continent and achieve cultural, scientific, and economic renewal is here and with young men and women taking the lead. Some call them the new school heroes. We call them under 40 CEOs. As CEO, Dozier is recording immense success as he keeps his clients happy. And I believe he is well on his way to making sure that PhD is one of the most desirable places to work in in Nigeria. The look of fulfillment on the faces of staff of PhD Media is definitely a testament to that. But how does he do it? What skills are necessary for a CEO to continually deliver on his mandate? So what do recognitions, nods, accolades, what, what do they truly mean to you? I think everyone strives for um, a sense of accomplishment, I guess. Um, for me, it's really about ultimately delivering what I need to do for, first of all, for the business, ensuring that the goals I set for myself and for my business are met. Once those goals are met, every other thing follows through because the truth of the matter is if I grow a client's business, I am in turn growing my business mm -hmm. because their growth is linked to mine. If I'm able to grow this business, every single member of staff grows as well because I can remunerate better, I can, I can pay bonuses, I can promote, I can incentivize. And, and collectively, we all do better. Um, the staff are also happier, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, those accolades and is really just a testament to the fact that if we are delivering those results, then we should get those recognition. If we're not getting those recognition, it's largely because we are not doing what we set out to do. Um, or maybe we are, but maybe we're not ambitious enough. You know, so it, it really is really like a barometer to measure how well you've traveled. That's the way I see it. All right, so as a man with a family, mm. um, would you say that work-life balance is a myth or it's achievable? Work-life balance is really creating time for my wife and creating time for the family. And, and they're not the same thing. So time with the wife, I deliberately make out time. Uh, every week, we spend some time, and then we plan an extended time away together. Then we also plan time for the family. And time for the family doesn't have to be some expensive um, day out. It could be at home, it could be some, some place nearby. Um, but I think for me, quality time spent with the family, spent with the kids, looking through their homework, going to school, yeah. attending events, um, their first day at school, be there to take them, you know, just find time, yeah. quality time to spend with them. And yeah. I think every family should be able to define what work-life balance means to them. This is under 40 CEOs. Programmatic buying in media is taken off in other parts of the world, but only just being discussed in these parts. I would like to hear Dozier's views on how this will affect the future of advertising in Nigeria and indeed in Africa. So tell me, Dozier, in 2017, you spoke at the Social Media Week uh, about programmatic marketing being the future of digital media in Africa. How so? And how will this uh, affect the agency model? So first of all, I believe it is the future because when it comes to defining target audience sets, um, online enables us to have very tailored and defined audience segments within the ecosystem where we can target them specifically. Now, what programmatic is really is being able to serve an advertising to the right audience the right content at the right time, meaning he is most receptive to the advertising. Um, one of the challenges we've had with digital advertising in the past is that you are bombarded with a barrage of advertising material that have no relevance to you whatsoever. So serving a man uh, uh, a sanitary pad ad, for instance, and it's none of his business. Um, so 
what programmatically helps us do is define or predetermine consumer sets that require or have searched or are interested in our advertising. And then it's it, even more effective. And the results have shown that it delivers better reach, it delivers, delivers better click-through rates. Um, overall impact of the campaign is a lot better and is more cost effective. Now, with regards to it being the future is because that is where digital advertising is headed, headed towards. You need to be able to give people advertising that they need, not just because they're online, right? So that is the space in which we, we, we want to move the industry towards. It's not new, it's not a novel idea. It's just really beginning to take off for us here. And companies are beginning to embrace it. So with digital spend increasing across different companies, the amount of money invested in programmatic is also increasing because the results are glaring. It shows that there's a lot more advantage in using that path uh, to, to reach your consumers. Just quickly talk about that in, in relation to um, collecting data because for you to properly program um, marketing, you need data. And um, there's this much debate right now. I mean, mm. there's Cambridge Analytica and, you know, how intrusive will the data collection be? I mean, it's a good question and it's something yeah. pretty recent. I mean, Mark Zuckerberg was on the stand yeah. recently. Um, <laughs> yeah, interesting to watch. Mm -hmm. um, it's important that people need to opt in for these data collection. I think what may have been happening in the past, I mean, I'm no authority on the matter, but um, the challenge will be people had not opted in and giving you permission to use their data in that fashion. Um, so I think it's very important that the data collection is based on actual consent given from the consumer to participate in any of these kind of inventory. If the client, if the consumer has not opted in for it, then his data shouldn't be used to that extent. Hmm. A publication described you as a thought leader, and you recently spoke at uh, Social Media Week on closing the gap between technology and humanity. Now tell me, what's your favorite thing to talk about? Um, I love to speak about tech. Um, I love to speak about technology. I like to speak about um, advancement in IT. But more importantly, how it affects my uh, industry. Because with advancement in technology, so take for instance, um, social media, smartphone penetration increasing, the number of hours in a day remains the same. So what that says to me is that if you're spending more time on your phone, you're spending less time doing something else. Or at the very least, you're media meshing. So you're either watching TV and still using your phone. So how, what is the implication of that on my media planning? What is the implication of my strategy? So if 10 years ago, when satellite um, smartphone penetration was less than 30%, and now that it's over 50%, how has that affected your strategy going forward? Because mm -hmm. the people you used to target solely on TV and radio, there's a huge bunch of them that are now available to you on, on, on digital, but gives you the added advantage of engaging them and getting almost real-time responses and interaction from them. So how is that affecting your strategy going forward? So I think for me, that is really the fun part of this job mm -hmm. because measurability and data collection and the data itself is getting more precise, is getting more accurate, but the insights we can draw from that data is even where the, more of the excitement lies. Because there's a lot of exciting work we're doing with people where we're saying, now we can really profile people, not just based on age, sex, and demographic, but based on their media usage. Because you could meet two middle-aged women and their media consumptions are very different. One watches 10 hours of TV a day, the other watches zero. Um, and it's all based on different parameters. And understanding these parameters and collecting this data and using the data for our strategies is really quite exciting. So tell me, Dozier, what are those key challenges um, you've had to overcome in business that has helped shape your person? In my line of work, you really need a client that will challenge you. Um, typically, you know, in this part of the world, we see that as a problem, or we see them as a problem client. Um, 
I see it some other way. I think when I meet those kind of clients, I love being in their boardrooms. I like, I love making presentations to them because they're constantly pushing you, whether it's for the right or wrong reasons, but you leave that boardroom better off. Mm. Um, I used to work for a client back in the day that would always question the strategy, would always pressure test every single slide. But what that did is that it made us a little bit more prepared every time we walked into that boardroom. So we do the pressure testing ourselves. After a while, we understood how the client thought and his thought process, and we developed a system that enables us to respond to every single element. But it made us research. Sometimes it made us travel. Sometimes it made us do surveys. It made us spend money. Mm. But then again, with every pitch, we got better. With every new business win, our strategies were more refined. So for me, those kind of clients are really very important to any agency. They help you grow. This is Under 40 CEOs. So tell me, how is travel and interacting with you know, diverse cultures um, and people added value to your person? Exposure is important. Mm. And I think it's probably one of the most important things uh, for any CEO in Africa. Um, one, you need to understand your continent, not just understanding your market. Because the bulk of the clients that require your services are thinking continent. They're not thinking Lagos. So you need to get yourself out of that mindset and think about the continent. Um, traveling has helped immensely because now you can speak more holistically about how advertising and how marketing comes is done across the sub-region, um, in Southern Africa, in the Middle East, in Europe. And then you have more and better well-rounded strategies than you can share with the clients. Um, you have better case studies, you have better reference points. Um, you can cite examples where certain strategies may not work and why. Um, you can tap into cultural nuances that will develop you more refined insights that drive your strategy. Um, and we've had instances, even in recent times, where we've had to pitch businesses across different geographies in West Africa. Now, travel was important because when I pitch in Ghana, I've lived in Ghana. When I, when I move, go to Senegal to discuss, I've been to Senegal. I can understand uh, the cultures. I know the people. I tell people that every time I travel, there are a few things I always do in every country. I listen to their radio, I watch their TV channels, I drive around the city and I visit the church. Um, it's some of the, and the market, yeah. Mm. It's one of the best ways to understand the culture of people. Yes, you can get a lot of info on slides in the boardroom, but you really need to hit the road and walk around and experience the city for yourself. Buy yourself a few souvenirs, but it helps you have a better understanding of that culture. And you'd be amazed how much that brings to bear within your strategy, even for your local market. So how would you describe your leadership style? I am probably one of the few um, CEOs in my industry that everybody saw as a trainee. Mm -hmm. At least those that have been in the industry long enough. So it makes sure pride is out the window. So my leadership style is really more around making sure that people around me are happy and understand my vision. Um, I allow as many people to question the vision mm. because it gives me an opportunity to explain it properly. Uh, I get a bit worried when everybody agrees. Um, so it tells me two things. It's either you agree just because I'm the MD or you're not listening because it's, it's most often than not, not everybody agrees 100% with what you're saying. So I really like it when people question the strategy so that you can have a more robust conversation and it sticks. I, I try to share as much understanding of our vision, where we are, what we're trying to do, and get people to tap into it. Um, when I joined the business, rejoined the business as managing director, um, we now have town hall meetings where I'm able to show them things about the business that ordinarily were not shared with them. Um, but I think it's important that every member of the staff feels vested 
in this company. They feel that they are part of it. They feel that uh, whatever role they play, be it from the receptionist to the cleaner to the strategist, there is an impact of your job on the overall growth of the business. Mm. Once people feel vested, they will work for you. They will give you their best every time they come to work. I try to make sure people enjoy coming to work. Um, not so many companies in Nigeria focus on that. But the reality is that once people wake up every morning and are happy to be here, the attitude is totally different. The, the response rates, the reaction to clients, the speed, the understanding, everything changes about that person. Um, so I think it's something I also focus on. I love to teach. Um, so I do a lot of training. Um, training runs from strategy to planning to even basic Excel, creating templates, macros, uh, writing formulas in Excel. Just, I just love playing with computers as well. Mm. So it's something I try to pass on to all my staff as well. So uh, many of them know me for it. Every Friday, I huddle all of them in a room and I try to teach them something. So we've got a PhD academy that I run, but more importantly, we now start to get external facilitators to also increase um, the knowledge base. Tell me, what values are important to you and the firm, PhD? The values that are important to me, and as well as the business, are quite simple and straightforward. One, openness. It's important that people are open, not just to their client, but to each other. Uh, because it drives the second value, which is collaboration. Um, collaboration, not just with people in your team, but across functions. Um, even within your client spaces, you must strive for collaboration because the results are always better. I mean, the evidence is abundant. Are always better when you work with people. Um, curiosity is another key value, and we try to drive it through the system. Um, my people would tell you, when we have meetings, I always pick on the person who is not talking. Um, because I really want people asking questions. I really want people being curious. No matter how stupid the question may sound, ask. Because you would definitely be better off after you've asked the question. Um, another important value for me, I would say, is honesty and integrity. Um, if you say something, please do it. Um, and don't commit to anything you can't keep. Um, mm. it's, it's a running joke here, you know, I, when, when people, when I give an instruction and they tell me, uh, we'll do it by the grace of God, I say, no, tell me whether you can do it <laughs> or not, right? I would prefer you tell me mm. it's not going to be ready today, it's mm. going to be ready on Friday. I'd rather leave this conversation with that mindset. Don't set yourself up to fail just because you felt you had to say something um, to make people feel good. Um, but again, it, it can put you in difficult situations where you feel you must make a commitment, but you need that courage, which is also another value. Mm -hmm. um, you need that courage to be able to look situations in the face and really explain why certain things have to be the way they are. Um, it may not give you the kind of reaction you want, but trust me, you'll always be better off when you're honest, mm. you have integrity, mm. or you have the courage to also face all those situations. Mm. Um, so courage is important, okay. very important as well. So what would you say is the biggest letdown that you've experienced in your career so far? I wouldn't say there is one biggest letdown, but I think we've Within my career, I think there have been instances where things probably haven't gone as planned. Um, sometimes with regards to new business, um, sometimes with regards to um, career, uh, where I felt I should be at a certain point in time that didn't pan out as, uh, as quickly mm. or as uh, to the scale that I would have wanted it to be. Um, that I would say it, it, it is the letdown, but quite honestly, I don't see a lot of letdowns because as much as I'm, 
an ambitious person. I'm also a realist. And one of the things I tell even my wife at home is strive to improve yourself daily. Strive to make sure that where you were this year is very different from where you were last year, in a positive way, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, and as long that is happening, and as long as that is consistent, you'll be all right. I mean, you'll be fine. Just make sure you keep that growth projectile going. Yeah. Um, even for the businesses that we operate, yeah, they would love to be, have 100% growth in one year, but realistically, you need to set a three or six year goal to reach that ambition. Mm -hmm. So it's the same thing. In your lives, set the same kind of long-term goals for yourself mm. and measure them as you go along. And what that measurement would be is up to the individual. This is Under 40 CEOs. Things may not always go as planned for the CEO, but I am yet to find someone with everything going as planned. Growth is a recurring theme in Dozier's life, but at this point, I would like to find out his lifestyle choices. Now, on to more fun stuff, yeah? What do you love to eat? I love to eat anything seafood. Hmm. Crabs, calamari, shrimps, prawns, fish. How would you describe your style? Your fashion style? Relaxed, mm -hmm. you know, they loose. Okay. Just be comfortable. What's your favorite brand to wear? TM Lewin. For shoes, Aldo. And for suits, John Smith. What's your favorite car to drive? BMW. What other CEOs do you currently look up to? Tolu Gukoya. Outside our industry, Dangote. And what's your favorite travel destination? It will be France. Okay. Paris. Your favorite book of all time? The Bible. What book are you reading right now that's not the Bible? I'm kind of obsessed with TED Talks. So I try to watch one TED Talk every, every day. Lastly, Dozier, I'd like to know, what makes you happy? It's really when I'm with my kids. Um, I've got two lovely boys. And um, for me, a good night out mm. is get home, have some good quality time with them, um, really let loose. We, we play some music, we dance. Um, my wife gets all amused over that. Uh, and then probably the next day, I take my wife out. We have a good time. That really is what makes me happy. Um, at the really core of it is family. Um, a lot of the things we do in life really is about making sure that the, the home front is fine. Mm -hmm. um, but at the core of it, it's really about keeping them happy. From the business lens, I love strategy. I love media strategy. Not so much the implementation, but the mm -hmm. strategy work, so much fun. So much fun. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, even till today, some of my planners, I, I'm, I, I tell them, let me do that one. Let, let, me, let, <laughs> you know, let me try my hands on that strategy. I read the brief, it's exciting. I've got some innovative mm. ideas we could use. Mm. So creating strategies, I mean, I could work on strategies into the night. Mm. That really keeps me going. Wow. Yeah. All right, thank you for coming on Under 40 CEOs. Pleasure, Dozier. absolute pleasure meeting you. I'm Dozio Kafo. You too can be an Under 40 CEO. Mm -hmm.